Joined tonight by our senior reporter here at 7 Eyewitness News, Eileen Buckley. And we are dedicating the next half hour of 7 Eyewitness News to a Buffalo Strong conversation that may be difficult to have for some people, but it is a conversation that we can all benefit from. The topic tonight is mental health. It's a topic that touches so many families, even more so since the pandemic began, turning our lives upside down more than a year ago. Now, before the pandemic, an estimated one out of every 10 adults in this country reported having some symptoms of anxiety or depression. And then by this past January, almost a year into the pandemic, that number had jumped up to four out of every 10 adults. And keep in mind, that's only the number of people who actually reported these symptoms. Many people did not. Our intention tonight is to help you and your family and your friends navigate a difficult conversation and to provide you with the resources that you might need. It is so important to remember in all of this, you are not alone. A lot of people are going through this right now over the past almost 14 months. Joining us tonight to help walk us through the next 30 minutes are Lynn Shine. She is a licensed mental health counselor and Carl Shallowhorn, chair of the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition. Thank you both of us for joining us here tonight. And the team of professionals who work with the Anti-Stigma Coalition face an uphill battle every day to educate the public about mental illness because even though much progress has been made over that time, that stigma exists. And that's where we'd like to really start tonight with our conversation. Research shows that only 40% of people struggling with mental health saw treatment because of the stigma associated with it. So Carl, first off to you, how great of a problem still exists with stigma surrounding mental health in the year 2021? Well, I'll tell you, Eileen, there's still a lot of stigma, like you said, for a lot of reasons. Many times people might be ashamed. They might be afraid to ask for help because they don't want to let their neighbors know, their family know, their employer know. And, and this has been historical. I mean, this is not, anything new as we know but it seems to be more exacerbated because unfortunately because of the pandemic uh, sometimes people don't want to admit that there's a problem when when there is and and we know if that keeps them from getting help it takes uh, an average up to 10 years for someone to seek help with a mental health concern and a lot of times that is due to the stigma that exists yeah, Carl, I'm glad you mentioned that because, as you say, this is nothing new. A lot of people have a hard time with life in general. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. A lot of people affected. And then this pandemic just made it worse. So mental health also affects really different segments of the population differently, depending on who you are. 60% of youth with depression, more than half, do not receive any kind of treatment whatsoever. We also see higher numbers of depression cases now among LGBT teenagers and also teenagers of color. And I recently spoke with one teenager who courageously shared her own struggles of this with from the past. Her name is Zenobia. But then the thoughts progressed and they got really like dark and heavy and they were more like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I just don't want to be in like the world anymore. And they were like really dark. And I'll be bringing you more of Zenobia's story tonight at six. Now, Lynn, let's move on to you. Talk to us tonight, if you could, about this. If you're a parent, what do you do here? How do you have this conversation with your child about their mental health? And how do you even know? Are there signs that maybe they're having some difficulties? We, we, I always talk to, to my parents to talk to them as if they are the flight attendants in their child's life. And I like them to think about when we are looking at the pandemic, it's like being on a turbulent flight. And we're, we're to look at our kids and say, look, um, we're going through a whole lot of changes right now. And it's, we look at it as adults as we're looking at a lot of losses. And with kids, as well as with ourselves, there's existential losses of not really even understanding who we are at this point. We're used to our routines that we get up, we go to school, or we have our everyday routines that are going on. And when the pandemic happened, there was an absolute loss of control. And if you're going to look at anxiety, anxiety and control go on a one-to-one -one ratio. When we lose control, our anxiety escalates. So 
so I like us to say, look, there's a whole lot of changes right now, and we're in control. We are our child's flight attendant. So it's important that both parents say, um, you know, stay on the same team, and we're working together, and say, what is happening with you at this point? Um, and pay attention to that everyone feels out of control, how normal it is, and try to normalize it because they are not feeling as if they have any control at this point. And, um, and that's the most important piece is helping to normalize it for them. Just because quickly, they, they don't, they lose the sense of who they are. Is it obvious to parents? I mean, is it obvious to see or is it tough to see? It's really very difficult to see because kids, when you look at teenagers, for instance, kids like to stay in their room um, and kids, you know, are, are focusing on their phone. Uh, and what I like to tell parents is any kind of difference is what I want you to pay attention to. So if they're normally in their room, um, but you're not hearing from them as much or they're not eating as much and they're not wanting to come down for dinner or any kind of changes or they're quiet or they're louder I want you to pay attention to any kind of changes at all or you're hearing from their teachers that they're not turning in assignments and um, they're getting they're getting angrier because our amygdala part of our brain is shooting off cortisol and that's what happens when we're getting when we're getting anxious and that's just like any other kind of steroid that we take. So they're going to get either anxious or angry. And when that happens, uh, you're going to see changes in their personality or there's going to be a complete shutdown. And if there's a shutdown, you're, you're noticing that they're feeling a little depressed, then I want you to pay attention to that as well. And Carl, we'd like your thoughts on this as well, because I know I've read and, and reported on in the past that a lot of times a severe mental health problem will set in at the around the age of 14, I believe. So this is a very important conversation to have at that youth level right now. Absolutely. In fact, I think many times when, when I, I agree with what Linda's saying, you want to look and see uh, what's what's going on that may not be typical for the for the for the youth or the teen, and and I think parents oftentimes are the ones to recognize these things. But also there are others. It might be teachers or coaches, uh, you know, other you know uh, youth leaders that might be the person who can maybe figure out or see something that that might not typically be there that normally would be or they might stop activities they might stop sports they might stop uh, other things that they typically were doing that would be of interest so you know those are the things that you want to look for as well and i think overall we, we've seen this 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 increase in issues amongst uh, all ages but the pandemic certainly has increased this with young people i mean it's, it's a trauma i mean this is a major trauma for all of us, but especially for those who have been impacted in a way that the routines are, are disrupted in every way you can imagine. All right, we know that for a fact this is out there and it's just gotten worse, as you say, because of the pandemic. So let's take a minute here and talk about access to help, regardless of how old you are. 11% of Americans with a mental illness are uninsured. That's according to Mental Health America. So if you don't have health insurance or your friend, your family member are not insured, what do you do? Um, Carl, let's start with you. Well, there are resources where you can get help. Uh, there's self-help resources. We know there are support groups. For instance, the Mental Health Advocates of West New York has a number of support groups for people that are no cost. They are run by peers and others, people with lived experience. So that's certainly a place to go. Also, many uh, agencies have uh, sliding fee scales so that will serve people that might uh, not have insurance or might be uh, in a situation where they might need that support too. So that's also another thing I would say as well is to, to access those services that might be available. All right. So, Lynn, it's like uh, getting the COVID vaccine. You don't have to have insurance to get it. People were worried that they wouldn't be covered. You can get help for this, and it doesn't matter if you don't have any health insurance right now. Absolutely. 
Yes, and there's there's also many resources. Um, and if you are questioning things, you always call Crisis Services. is a wonderful, you, you know, eight three four three one three one. If you're questioning anything, they're a wonderful resource guide that you can call them and ask what's available in the area, and and ask for free resources if you're questioning anything. And that's always a great number to put to put up and to for people to know if they're feeling in crisis. And that's that's good. And and also. Um, there's so many different resources and podcasts and different things to, to look up that are great self-help and meditation and um, different things that have been wonderful resources for my clients during the pandemic that, um, that have been helpful that if they're not in the crisis mode but they're feeling down, there's been some great resources for them as well. All right, thank you. Stay with us. When we come back tonight, we're going to talk about relationships with your children and your significant other and some pandemic silver linings, believe it or not. Don't go away. Welcome back once again to our Buffalo Strong Conversation tonight, focusing on mental health and wellness. 7 Eyewitness News senior reporter Eileen Buckley joining us here at 530 tonight. Also with us tonight, licensed mental health counselor Lynn Shine and Carl Shallowhorn, chair of the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition. 
Well, let's focus now on what we cherish the most, our relationships with our loved ones. We know the pandemic has had a big impact on our interactions with family members, both physically and emotionally. From stress and social isolation to financial strain, anxiety and the distribution of childcare and household responsibilities. So how do you manage your mental health and relationship at home? Support each other and learn to be responsive. Make fun a priority and establish boundaries, making sure you are acknowledging the need for both personal time and together time. All right, Lynn, this is a topic that you're having conversations with people about every day. Many people at home certainly can relate to uh, these anxiety problems and you know, all these unknowns that we're facing now because of this pandemic. So walk us through this with your spouse. Well, if you've ever had any kind of roommate, um, you can imagine being with somebody, somebody every single day, every hour of the day, 24-7, um, without much boundary. Um, it, it's been a very difficult thing to be with somebody and then add to it the amount of anxiety that people are experiencing and the fear of loss. And that has been an anxiety and depression. It's been so difficult for people. And then there's been uh, the stresses of having children at home, if there's children uh, teaching them school, as well as needing to work. And then add, mix, mix it up with uh, differences of opinion. Some people think it's okay for us to go out without masks when the other partner said absolutely not it's okay to go to a restaurant absolutely not uh, it's okay to let our kids have play dates no it's not then we have some people having um you know drinking more than they normally do and like you said the financial problems and some people have lost their jobs so it's it's really had an absolute increase in anxiety and depression and it's been very difficult for people and so what I'm asking people to do is really have uh, compassion for one another instead of uh, instead of going at one another all the time uh, you can either be right or you can be married so so it's really important to sit back and instead of constantly going at one another I, I want people to really have some compassion for one another and to look out for one another and to take care of one another because it's such an incredibly difficult time. So um, there's lots of lots of tasks that I'm asking people to do. You also um, say you also walks say walks together at night. You say be curious, not furious, and cool it with the criticism and walk yeah. and talk, as you mentioned, uh, and ask for what you need and what you want. It goes both ways, right? Absolutely, because um, curious versus furious is, you know, you, you don't like something that someone is saying, right? So instead of immediately criticizing and jumping on them, then ask, say, I don't think I like what you're saying. Did you mean to say that? Instead of an immediate defensiveness, you know, um, I always say that if you hear a noise in the middle of the night, we don't run outside with a shotgun and start shooting. I hope not. You, you listen and say, what is, what is that that I hear? And you investigate. And that's what I'm wanting people to do here. I'm wanting people to say, I, I'm not liking what I'm hearing you say. Is this what you meant? So give people the benefit of the doubt, your partner the benefit of the doubt, and try to figure out what's going on, you know, with them. And, you know, what I was saying earlier in terms of being um, a flight attendant for your kids, this is really important here, is that when I, I don't have phobia of an airplane, but none of us like turbulence, right? So when I get on an airplane, I always check and say, all right, where is the flight attendant? And I look over and I say, if there's turbulence, and I say, are they okay? And if they're okay, then I feel okay. And our children are watching us the same way. So if you are upset about everything that's going on right now, and of course we are, 
But if we are arguing with one another, our children are watching us. If we're saying, oh my gosh, it's the lost year, um, our children are really going to suffer and this is terrible and this is horrible. That's like the turbulence on the plane. All right, if I, we're upset, I, they're I, going I, to be more upset. All right, Eileen, you, got, you had a question. Go ahead. Well, absolutely. Carl, I wanted to talk to you about the stigma existing within families and that puts up barriers because I know we talked a little bit earlier. You mentioned it takes about 10 years for someone to go seek help. So what do people need to do to get that help? Well, you know, it's interesting, Eileen. I get the question all the time. I have a loved one that doesn't want to seek help. What do I do? And that's, that's actually very challenging. But we know that by being compassionate, like Lynn said, practicing empathy. Uh, one program that I teach is called Mental Health First Aid. And then one of the things we talk about there is listening not judgmentally. So we want to be able to listen to someone and, and hear them fully. And, and also to practice empathy. Empathy goes a long way. That's along the same lines as having compassion, but being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes will help you to, to get to a place where you can get past that place of blaming uh, the other for something that perhaps they don't even have control over. We know that anyone who has a mental health challenge of one kind or another, they didn't ask for that. They didn't ask to have anxiety. They didn't ask to have depression. It's something that unfortunately happens. So basically, people need all the support they can get. So addressing the stigma within families is really important. And also being open to talk about these things within families because you don't want to keep this stuff a secret. Because, because obviously, like Lynn said, uh, children will pick up on it. The other person will pick up on it, the partner. So by talking about it, getting open to the, uh, out in the open and communicating, that really go a long way with addressing stigma. All right, thank you, Carl. When we come back tonight, believe it or not, some silver linings from the past year that you can bring into your home to help things out and how everyone in your household can take a pledge to stop the stigma. That's when Buffalo Strong Conversation Health and Wellness returns. Don't go away.
Welcome back once again to our Buffalo Strong conversation tonight on mental health and wellness. There is nothing over the past year that has challenged us more than this. But as is often said, there is hope out of darkness comes light. And out of the pandemic comes silver linings. And Lynn, you shared these with us. The conditions of the past year have been built on resilience, created a sense of purpose for many people, taught empathy and allowed altruism and allowed more connections with family who we live with, with home traditions as well. Lynn, I, I believe it's- That's exactly it's, right. It's important to celebrate these bright spots I, I really do believe that it is. And I think that if you remember that resilience, building resilient children is helps them be productive adults. And if we focus on that, I think that that's a great thing to focus on instead of only focusing on the lost year. Uh, I think it's really important, Len, isn't it? To, to, to make sure people understand, as we mentioned, there is hope. We're going to, we're going to get out of this, right? We are going to get out of this, and that's the most important thing is look ahead, think about one year from today, and that is helpful to not just stay stuck in now. All right, Eileen, go ahead. Well, Carl, I really want to get to the anti-stigma pledge and how people out there can take this pledge and stop using words and phrases that contribute to the stigma surrounding mental health. Absolutely. So one thing we know is that everyone uh, from time to time says, well, how can I be an advocate for mental health? Well, the way you can do that is to go to our website at letstalkstigma.org. And you can agree to do things like not use stigmatizing language. You can also educate yourself about mental health. We have a newsletter that you can opt in for, and all you have to do is put in your email address, and you can join over 3,500 people who have taken a pledge in our community, and it's growing every day. All right, uh, guests, thank you very much for being with us today. Eileen, good to have you with us here uh, in the studio for 7 Eyewitness News at 530. Uh, hopefully, we've been able to help some people, guide some people out there, and uh, help them feel better with their families and with their uh, partners or their loved ones. So again, thank you all for being here. We're going to do more of this in the weeks to come. That's it for uh, 530. Don't go away, though. 7 Eyewitness News at 6 begins in just a moment.